Hello and welcome. I have the great honor of sitting here once again with Swami Shankarananda, and we're here for a live uh, Q and A session. So, if during the course of this interview you have questions that you'd like to ask your Swamiji, you can write them in the comments below. And at the end of the Q and A, uh, if we have time, we'll try and get to them. Um, I just want to remind all of you watching out there in Radio Land that if you do like. Um, this darshan, this time spent with Swami Shankarananda, you can always uh, check out the website for more streaming and on-demand programs with Swamiji, and that's at www.satsanglive.com.au. Welcome, Swamiji. Welcome. Hi, Navaraj. Nice to see you again. It's so nice to be here. Uh, every week you've been guiding us through uh, a study of your text, uh, Consciousness is Everything, which is a survey of Kashmir Shaivism. And I have to say that it's been the highlight of my week each week. And uh, this past week, you were talking about kind of the overarching tantric narrative or a way that we could summarize all of Kashmir Shaivism in a couple of different points. And I think it's such an excellent starting point for someone who uh, is getting first exposed to tantric philosophy or the philosophy of Kashmir Shaivism, and I was wondering if you'd share that with the, the viewers out in Radio Land. Well, happy to put it all out there. Um, well, you know, uh, it's very easy to get lost in details. You look at Kashmir Shaivism, and there are volumes and volumes. Uh, sage like Abhinava Gupta has written uh, endlessly on, on Shaivism, and many, many scholars have written about it. And there are many details uh, but I always like to look at the big picture. And the biggest picture about Kashmir Shaivism that you can have is one sentence, which is, everything is consciousness. That summarizes Kashmir Shaivism. Everything is consciousness. What does that mean? It means that the fundamental stuff of the universe is consciousness, not brute, insensate matter, which is the way we hold it in the West. Uh, we think that everything is material and consciousness sprang from it at some point. But this reverses it completely in quite a mind-blowing way. If you start to contemplate what it means that the universe has its being, moves and has its being and grows from and recedes into the principle of consciousness, you have a whole different universe. So everything is consciousness is the basic uh, idea. But of course, you know, I was trained uh, uh, as a literary scholar, and so um, uh, I'm very fond of narratives. In fact, everybody loves a good story. And so it occurred to me as I studied Shaivism that there's a story that Shaivism's telling. <clears throat> and again, this is a big picture because it's not about the details. It's a, the big picture story. And I think that if you grasp the big picture, then everything makes sense to you. You don't have to worry too much about the details. You'll effortlessly absorb details that are important to you. The big picture narrative is, it's the story of consciousness. And at the beginning, consciousness alone is. Uh, there's, no, there's nothing outside of consciousness, and consciousness is undivided, it's whole, it's full of uh, light, it's full of love, it's full of energy, uh, it's one. We would call it God, but God beyond form. Uh, it's a, a knowing, and it's probably uh, making some noise that sounds like Om. It's just sort of, uh, as uh, Paul Ortega says, it's burbling to itself, it's humming. Mm. And this is consciousness. <clears throat> then goes on for uncharted billions and billions of years, enjoying the sport of itself. Uh, and then finally a stray thought comes into its mind. A possibility says, what would happen if I became many? If I became more than just oneness? And that's a very bad thought for consciousness to have because uh, in an infinite expanse, uh, then all kinds of infinite possibilities are potential. And when consciousness conceives of them, immediately they occur. So consciousness becomes the universe. 
he decides, I will become many. Now, this is, of course, metaphoric. We don't know quite what consciousness was thinking. In fact, we could say, what were you thinking? But we could ask him, what were you thinking creating this uh, uh, virus that you've created or the world wars or whatever? But uh, that's for another day. So consciousness becomes many and loses his identity as consciousness in becoming many. And in that process, he becomes each of us. Because <clears throat> according to Shaivism, we are that same consciousness, that same Shiva, but in limited form. We become contracted and we think we're individuals while all the time we're actually Shiva, but we don't know it. So now we're lost in individuality and we're lost also in lack. Consciousness itself has no lack, has complete fulfillment. But as individuals, there are many things we lack and many things we don't like, and many things we resist. And because of that, we suffer. And we suffer from de deprivation, and we suffer from unpleasant things, and we're full of fear, and we're full of greed, and we're full of anger and, and depression, and all these things. And basically, we know there's a problem. The story goes, we, we suddenly have a problem. Uh, Shiva has become all of us, now he has a problem. <clears throat> so we, we set about solving the problem. There's not one of us that isn't trying to solve that problem. Uh, but we're kind of stupid now in our limited sense since we become limited. Um, and so we solve it stupidly. And so the first step is consciousness. In Sanskrit, it is chitti or chaitanya. This is pure consciousness. Then it goes through a process of contraction. And in Sanskrit, that's called mala. So chaitanya, or chitti, mala, limitation. Uh, all the great properties, the infinite properties of conscious become limited, and we, and here we are. Limited will, limited action, limited thought, limited emotion, that's who we are. Mm. Same as conscious, but limited. So then, we go along looking for means out of this problem of limitation. So the next step is upaya, which is method. And we use many methods to find out, to get back to what we want to be. Uh, one method is uh, trying to acquire objects, get rich, have houses and cars. Another method is find the perfect person, the relationship, and find love and that. Uh, Another method is to become famous and have a big career. There are so many methods that we use, all of them leaving, uh, getting to uh, uh, disappointment. Because as the Buddha pointed out, there is old age, disease, and death. And no matter how successful you are, you have to face all those things, loss and aging and so on. <clears throat> so... Then you get in despair over that, you can turn to uh, drugs and intoxicants, alcohol, whiskey, uh, um, drugs, to numb the pain or to provide a false nirvana. It's another upaya. Finally, according to the story of Shaivism, after many lifetimes threshing about trying to, all of these uh, sort of inferior upayas, you finally discover there is a royal road of yoga. There is a path. It's the mystical path. It's the spiritual path. It's the inner path. Um, and there are many varieties and many different uh, types or uh, styles on this path. Um, and you discover there is a path and you try to discover the truth through inner means, basically through meditation, through contemplation, through self-inquiry. Uh, and so that's the third factor, upaya or sadhana, spiritual practice. And it came in my life, it came as a revelation to me uh, in my late 20s that there was a path and that there were people who had walked this path even now and that I could find one to be my teacher. And that was uh, extraordinary revelation to me. And so then you practice, and you practice, and you practice. 
And ultimately, after practicing for the required time, no one knows what time that is, uh, you come back to where consciousness outweighs the contraction. And you get to mukti or liberation. And you are more, you, you take your stance more in consciousness than in separation. Separation is, is uh, symbolized by matter. So you're more in universal consciousness, more in love, more in joy, more in peace than you are in limitation. And now you're well advanced towards mukti. So that's the, that's the, the narration. It's a circle. It comes back. Consciousness loses grip on itself. Then it finds its way back to a method and then it returns to the starting point. It's a beautiful, satisfying circle. It's a narrative arc, as we would say back in graduate school. Uh, and that's the basic picture of Shaivism. So where are we as human beings? Some of us are asleep to what the story is. We're still in the phase where we're trying to work out this gnawing problem of life by means of acquisition or relationship or becoming blotto on drugs. Um, and some of us have found that, that none of those things are satisfying and are practicing, we're seekers. We're seeking the higher. Uh, and some of us have advanced so that we have a taste of the, uh, of the goal. But Shaivism says that every one of us will return to Shiva. Why is that? Because Shiva is always stronger than our ignorance. Mm. No matter how far, I used to think, God, my ignorance is so profound and it must be stronger than God, but no. God is stronger than even my ignorance. So there's hope for everybody. And the, the, if we cooperate with the process, which is not that easy to do, we can make it less painful and shorter. So cooperate with Shiva, cooperate with consciousness, move towards consciousness and rest in consciousness and you won't regret it. You'll feel fulfilled, you'll feel happy, you'll feel loved. That's the narration in a nutshell. I think this this narrative is endlessly fascinating because not only is it the narrative of Shiva, but it's the narrative of us as individuals. And it's happening in all places and all circumstances at every moment. You know, so we can watch each other live through the story and play our part in it. And, and we get so puzzled with, oh, how will I solve this issue? How will I solve? And we're stuck in this. And, um, and uh, you know, Shiva has thrown us a curveball, hasn't he, lately? <laughs> with the virus that thing came out of left field continued baseball metaphor oh, yeah <laughs> but, so here we are and uh we have to not let it separate us from the highest mm. sometimes in the tantric literature and the scriptural tradition of our of what we study they refer to shiva as the self or baba mutanda called shiva as the self of all could you maybe unpack for us what exactly is a self <laughs> I, it's funny, I asked Baba once in, in a question and answer session, I said, you keep talking about the self. What is the self? He looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> I said, it, you know, everybody knows his own self. He says, don't you know the self? That's who you are, the self. So um, it, can, it can be explained many ways. But first of all, awareness can move in two directions. It moves out to the world and sees other people. And then it can move in and rest in itself. And we know how valuable that is because when we sleep, we turn within and we rest in ourselves and we get restored by that. Mm. So in meditation, we turn within without falling asleep, but we rest in our own self. Self is your subjectivity. It's that which is intimate, that which is close to you. And when you go there, you draw new strength and new power. Uh, and that self exists in every person. Mm. And the best way is not to talk about it theoretically, but to meditate. And all the people I know who meditate, which are many, swear by it. They know that they get tremendous sustenance from meditation. So I would recommend try meditation for a month, even 15 or 20 minutes a day, and turn to your own self. You know, everyone's subjective world 
is private to them. Like whatever goes on in your mind is basically private to you. And there's an interior world we all have. And that's the interiority of the self. And we know that a little bit, but if we focus more on that, we can become very strong, very powerfully centered there. And uh, so this is the self. It's very hard to uh, uh, describe it because it's not a, a place or a thing, but it is a direction. It's a movement in. Uh, one very good one, Gurdjieff used to say, uh, self-remember. Mm. And the Sargdata says, contemplate the I am. So if you make a sentence, I am a man, I am a woman, I am an American, I am an Australian, um, they would say, stop at I am. Feel your I amness. Feel your, what does it mean to be? This sense of I am. Just go and contemplate I am, what it feels like to be you without thinking about it, just feeling it. And that's a good way to start uh, to understand the self. Mm. Sometimes the self is described as um, <clears throat> its fundamental essence as being Satchitananda, existing of these three kind of components. And if our nature is this word Satchitananda, being kind of the bliss of being or truth, consciousness, bliss, yeah. If that's our, if bliss is our real nature, why aren't we blissful all the time? And then why do we confuse being the self sometimes with being self-directed? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's a big question now. <laughs> um, it's a, it, the Vedic, the Vedic uh, uh, analysis, Sat, Chit, and Nanda. Sat is being, mm. beingness. Chit is consciousness, awareness. And Ananda is bliss. So there's a, there's a, a component where we just is. Then there's a component uh, in which we are thinking, you know, conscious. And the third is we feel. So we know that we are, here we are, I am. Um, and we also are aware, I'm aware that I'm here. Um, some are dimly aware and some are more aware, but <laughs> we're aware. The real issue, as you say, is the, Ananda or bliss part, that can be sorely lacking. We can be very depressed. We can be very angry. We can be very lost. Uh, and so as you do sadhana, you do spiritual practice, you grow in the blissful part. That comes later. So focus on, on self and then bliss will grow mm. as you're more centered in it. We lose our bliss when we become separate and when we look to validate ourselves through externals, mm. we lose, we give our way our bliss. So uh, one of the great things about practicing yoga is that you grow in bliss and in fulfillment and peace in the emotional side. When the scriptures of our tradition talk about self-realization, is this the experience that they're pointing toward? Like what does, what does self-realization look like, taste like, smell like? <laughs> How do we know? How do we know we're there? Well, so it, it's a movement towards consciousness. Mm. You know, without without making it, uh, uh, giving it kind of ontological status, like arriving at um, Frankston Station so, <laughs> <laughs> or somewhere. <clears throat> um, it's um, the more we move towards consciousness, the more we grow in Satchitananda. We also grow in our consciousness. Uh, we, our minds become more full of light. Um, thinking becomes more expanded, less prejudiced, less narrow, less uncertain. So all these things. So uh, the land of consciousness is the land of liberation. Mm -hmm. And so as we as uh, we move in our sadhana towards self knowledge, we grow in that. Rather than saying there's a one moment where that all happens, but Growing consciousness and you won't even worry about the idea of liberation. When you're in touch with that, you're in touch with the Shakti, the, the spiritual energy, you'll feel completely liberated in that moment. Mm. I used to use my guru, I still use my guru as a, uh, as a homing device and that he was, he somehow embodied for me anyway, a stream of 
conscious awareness and of energy. And just thinking about him puts me in touch with that. So uh, for me, the guru is the most useful object in my, in my world. Mm. Just thinking about Baba uh, puts me in touch with that. In the West, um, consciousness is often thought of as a, a faculty of our mind. Like yeah. Consciousness exists in the mind. Um, could you maybe tease out when, when the East refers to consciousness, like what exactly are we talking about? Well, the mind, the mind is conscious, mm -hmm. but, the, um, but well, another way to say it is the mind draws its consciousness from another. That's what uh, the Shaivite masters would say. Mm. That other is universal consciousness. In one of the texts, it says that chitti, universal consciousness, becomes the mind, chitta, by contraction. But you see, it means that the mind is part of consciousness just like a river is part of the ocean. You know, it's in that relationship, it's still water. So if you look at your own mind, the mind's very aware and conscious. It has attributes of consciousness. Mm. But, you know, we in the 60s, we would say, expand your mind, man. <laughs> you know? And we did various upaya, we used different upaya for that. <laughs> um, but if we could expand our minds, uh, it would return to consciousness it's now it's it's conditioned and and uh, contracted by bad habits by dogma by false thinking false beliefs mm. um, but if we could expand it uh, it would return to consciousness so the mind has a lot of chitti in it a lot of consciousness and the more light we have we allow in the more inspired we are that's why we admire great writers, great artists, because they they have found a way to channel higher consciousness. But we have all have that capacity. We just have to find the way to align ourselves properly. Yeah, great art touches touches the universal. But when we as individuals feel abstracted from that experience, like when I when I feel like I can't touch higher consciousness and I feel separate from that, yeah. what do you recommend that I do to get back in touch with that? <clears throat> well, any you know, any method, uh, meditate, say the mantra. Mantra is mm -hmm. really good, uh, all-purpose um, thing to repeat the mantra, especially one that you've gotten from uh, a lineage of great beings who practiced it. Uh, repeating the mantra is uh, solid gold. Um, contemplating the higher truth, thinking about a form of God that you have a relationship with. Could be Jesus, could be Krishna, could be a guru. Uh, these are all access points that connect us to the self. Or just focusing on the self. Mm. Self's perfect. Or think about this guy, Shiva. Uh, these are all different, kind, almost like metaphors or doorways to that, that higher thing. Mm. So what... Why do you think Tantra centralizes the use of mantra? Why is the mantra so uh, enshrined in this tradition? Because it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I can't say why. I, I mean, that's a very good discovery. Yeah. Uh, I noticed Baba, I, I watched Baba closely because uh, to me, I could see, well, okay, divinity pouring out of him in everything he did. You know, like they say, that in the Hasidic tradition, uh, you don't go to hear the rabbi uh, teach about scriptures. They seem to tie his shoelaces. That's why you go. Which means that such a being, uh, uh, whatever he does, is radiates divinity. In uh, Shiva Sutras, it says kata japaha, which is uh, even a small talk is like mantra. Wow. <laughs> and and um, I used to see that in Baba. Just sit there. And he could be chattering, you know, like about with his buddies there about nothing, you know, and I would be getting waves of Shakti from it. And so uh, what was the question again? Why mantra? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I went far from that. <laughs> so, uh, oh, so I used to observe him and then I observed that he loved to give that teaching about mantra. Right. 
And I thought, why is that? And it's so simple and it's a no brainer. Here's what I think. This is pure projection. But I said, he looked, he said, here are all these Westerners. They're all very educated, they're smart. They're overly use their minds, but in a bad way. If they just said the mantra and quieted down, they do very well. Now, maybe <laughs> the same is true for the Indians too. Mm -hmm. But I, I saw that, that it was like a, a, a very good um, method for the Kali Yuga for our age, when we tend to get lost in self-hatred and doubt and fear and so many negative tendencies. So shut up, just tell your mind, shut up. <laughs> say the mantra, like in New York, that's what we say. Shut up, <laughs> say your mantra, shut up. I'm talking to you in Radio Land <laughs> and I'm talking to myself. <laughs> we have a, a question from Karuna, one of your students, and she writes, Dear Swamiji, from your memoirs, I'm picking up a central idea that complete surrender to the guru and the process of sadhana is key to spiritual transformation. How can one offer such surrender to the guru when living a worldly life away from the guru? Or at least, how do we do our best? Because the guru has um, an agent that uh, he sends with everyone. Yeah. And that agent's called the Shakti. And the guru lives within every person as the Shakti. And you become aware that there's a subtle yoga that you can practice which is connectedness to the Shakti. And it guides you. It always, it's, it's, a, it's like a, a GPS. It tells you when you're moving in the right direction and when you're moving in the wrong direction. And if you could follow it, you would grow and grow even in the absence of the physical guru. Of course, it's teaching you from inside. When you have a thought that's unwholesome, it makes you contract and feel absolutely miserable. And that's saying to you, bad thought, drop it. And then when you have a thought that's sublime and uplifting and you feel nourished in every cell of the body, it's saying to you, good thought, think like that. <laughs> and um, so it's always there, but we don't pay attention to it and, and we can't work it out. When you get confused, though, say the mantra because that's a no brainer. Mm. Sometimes, you know, when you get really confused and caught in negative emotions, your mind's not working properly. And won't, you won't be able to punch your way out of a paper bag, as it were. So say the mantra then. But if you can use, if you can find your intellect, then it'll say, follow the upward shift, is what we call it, mm. and go away from the downward shift. It's really so simple as to be almost impossible. <laughs> <laughs> You, I love how you describe the Shakti as being a, an agent of the Guru. Is there also a force at play that um, moves us away from the Shakti? Alas! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Vedanta they call it Maya, mm -hmm. or the cosmic illusion. Uh, but when you ask them what it is, they say, we can't explain it. So there is uh, some kind of force of uh, contraction or mala, contraction of ignorance, uh, that somehow part of the cosmic process, and it's always there ready to grab us if we're not vigilant. Mm. Um, but it's not strong as the self, and it can be overcome by, by holding on to the self. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's definitely there. Otherwise, sadhana would be no fun. You know, you need a villain in any narrative, don't you? Yeah. And you need a tension, a dramatic tension. Conflict. Yeah, conflict. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. otherwise, no good. I'm, I'm sure that in some universes that consciousness has created, there wasn't any conflict. And so it all went back whole very quickly. Mm -hmm. So then he said, no, nah, I'm going to make it more difficult this time. <laughs> I have uh, one more from from a viewer. Rabia writes, uh, would you mind talking about the importance of self-acceptance in this time? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that was my main issue when I was with Baba. I wrote an article called uh, Sadhana of Self-Acceptance. Uh, I realized that uh, a lot of my inner 
thinking was what I call tearing thoughts or mm. lack of self-acceptance, beating myself up and hating myself. And that's a tendency. I think it's in our culture. We tend to do that. And it's a very bad tendency. So look and observe and see if you beat yourself up. See if there are tearing thoughts, which thoughts that attack you, your own thoughts that attack you. It's not like the government attacking you or your enemy attacking you. They're your own thoughts. And you've lost control of your own thoughts and they attack you. So you have to gain control of them. You have to stop uh, stop letting them attack you. You have to start to love yourself and accept yourself. And that's a tremendous key. As you start to do that, then you start to move towards who you really are. Uh, we can be so vicious against our own self, tear into our own self, destroy uh, the fabric of our heart. So we should stop doing that. So if you can't do it, the mantra, when I went to a really bad phase in Ganeshpuri with Baba, he said, do the mantra intensely, 24 hours a day, he said. Uh, and it helped me a lot. So Wonderful. love yourself and accept yourself. Wonderful. I love that this tantric narrative ultimately is, it's like a homecoming to ourselves, you know? It's, yeah, that's right. It's so beautiful. And I love so cool complete. And I love that we get to go on that journey with you uh, every <laughs> every week, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's great fun. Yeah. So if you'd like for the viewers at home, if you would like to um participate in any of the programming that we have uh via the Ashram online website, you can check out more streaming and on-demand programs at www.satsanglive.com.au. Swamiji, is there anything you want to say to Radio Land before we sign off? I enjoy being with you. I can't see you, but I can feel you. And I can feel your love. And in this very difficult time, be smart, keep yourself safe, and have great faith. Uh, we'll go beyond this, and consciousness will win. God will win, and we will reemerge, and we'll learn some lessons from it. Uh, so meditate. Don't neglect your spiritual life. Uh, and be intelligent. And that's it. We'll see you soon. Dr. Nath Maharaj Kijay.